Our lecture 12 is about uh, the Black-Scholes formula and the dynamic delta hedging. In our textbook, the Black-Scholes formula is uh, introduced and discussed in chapter 12, but dynamic delta hedging is actually in chapter 13. So uh, this last lecture will cover some materials from both chapter 12 and chapter 13 in our textbook. So we will start to talk about the uh, Black-Scholes formula. Fisher Black and Myron Scholes uh, wrote their paper in 1973, uh, developed this formula. And this formula is also related to the work by Robert Merton. Black uh, Fisher Black, we have lost him, but both Scholes and Merton are still um, with us. In our CFA curriculum, this formula is called Black Scholes Merton formula. So that's the full name you will see when you study in the CFA curriculum. We have talked about the binomial formula in chapter 10. I have also mentioned that when you put the binomial formula into infinity, divide up the whole period into infinite subperiods so that your binomial tree become a very dense tree, or many, many, many layers of branches. Then you can also derive the same result. Okay, so you can view the Black-Scholes formula, which is the pricing formula for European option, as a limiting case of the binomial formula. And that is in Cox Rose Rubinstein 1979 paper. Um, this formula mainly consider the European options. Okay. And there's an underlying stock for this European option. That's that's the basic context for this formula. Now look at take a short look at what they uh the formula says. So it tells us that the uh, option value, right, those con puts here, lowercase is European option, depends on the, you know, the subtrix saying what? It's the current uh, option premium at the time, lowercase t, at the current time, depends on the current underlying price, the spot price at lower case t right strike price for the uh, option sigma is the standard deviation of the underlying three term r here is the risk of free rate capital t is the expiration data of the option then finally delta this is from our textbook delta is the dividend yield Okay, so yes, there's R and Sigma, but Sigma here actually related to the underlying, the return standard deviation of the return of the underlying stock. The risk of free rate here, the lowercase r, is just the risk of free rate. So that's what determines the uh, option premium. And then how it's determined, we need to uh, have a contrast between con and put, right? For the car, it's the spot price times something minus the strike price times something. For the put, it's the strike price times something minus the spot price times something, right? It, it makes basic sense because the car payoff depends on the maximum between zero or the uh, spot. Uh, the expiration price of the underlying minus the strike price, right? And obviously the expiration price of the underlying will relate to the spot price, the spot price of the underlying now. And for put, right, at the expiration, the payoff is the maximum between zero or the strike price, X minus 
the uh, expiration price of the underlying. And now you can see, right, even though this formula looks complicated, they, they actually give you the basic uh, link to the payoff. And we will see later on, there are even more links to the, uh, to the terminal values, okay? The, um, you know, from time t, our current time lowercase t here. Um, all this risk of free rate, the uh, dividend yield actually adjust the underlying price to its forward price. We'll see that later on. And we also know the strike price. Strike price itself is a future date payment. It's a future value. So it's quite natural to discount it. Remember, we are talking about European option. Uh, obviously, you should discount the strike price because it cannot be exercised before the expiration date. So now you can see there's some adjustment here, right? This is more like the tailed amount. Uh, when you discount the spot price of the underlying stock with the dividend yield, and when you discount the strike price using the risk of free rate, that's the uh, present value of the strike price. Now, we settled on the intuition of these two terms, and we need to think about what this ND1 and ND2 are. N here is the cumulative distribution function of a standard normal distribution. Okay, uh, that is actually come from the assumption of the underlying stock price movement. It's a log normal uh, winner process. Uh, we will have a closer look on that, but we won't uh, really get into the theoretical details. Um, but D1 here, D1 here need to be the uh, input in this cumulative distribution function, the n here, right? And what is D1? D1 has a denominator. Denominator is basically a standard deviation. If you think about something like a t value or z value, that's, you know, you have a normalization using the standard deviation so that you can get into the standard normal or a, you know, standard t distribution. So that's, that's what it does. And in the numerator, if we look at it on the space value, right? The first term is just kind of the log return or something like that, right? Close to a log return, uh, no minus one, but it's a relationship between the spot price of the underlying and the strike price, which makes sense, right? That's sort of the starting point. The starting point. And then, based on this starting point, we adjust proportional to time. Also, for the uh, standard deviation in the denominator, we adjust that for the time. And right? it's kind of proportional to the time left in the life of the option. Uh, for the risk of free rate and uh, dividend yield. We will see later on, these two actually belong inside of the log. It actually kind of put the forward price of the underlying and the um, future payment of this strike price, okay, together. So these two terms, you can sort of say it's also the kind of normal grow of this pair relationship, right? The, the underlying stock price and the strike price. Um, so that's this, the risk of free rate and the dividend yield. And then it's plus, plus a half of the variance, right? Of the underlying return proportional to the rest of the life of this option. So, in the numerator, the key thing for D1 is actually this plus. It's a plus of a half of the uh, variance, sigma squared, 
okay, the square of the standard deviation. And D2 is just D1 minus the denominator. If we look at the so-called standard version in the CFA curriculum, where we assume the dividend yield is zero, okay, the dividend yield is not there. So we drop all the dividend yield in our previous formula uh, from the one is from the one that attached to the uh, spot price of the underlying stock. The other is we inside the D1 or D2, right? We got this set of formula. Now, if we look at D2 here, we spell out what it is. It's actually this very similar. It's very similar to D1. Also start from this log of the ratio between the underlying spot price and the uh, strike price. Plus, well, risk of free rate, you cannot get rid of that. And then minus, it's not plus anymore for D2, it's minus. Minus a half of the uh, variance of the underlying return. So that's the, that's the key difference between the two. Then if you think about it, right, D1 is sort of going up, going up by a half of the variance, then D2 is going down by a half of, of the variance. <clears throat> and that, I'm not say this is directly related to the binomial formula, but maybe this can help us to memorize what is D1 and what is D2. Obviously, we only need to memorize D1 because once you have D1, D2 is just, you know, D1 minus the denominator. It's easy to memorize in that way. And for the CFA exam, you actually need to memorize it. As always, our trick for this kind of extremely complicated formula on an exam that is high pressure and uh, make you very nervous, right? What do we do is we first understand it, right? I give you a lot of in, uh, intuition uh, what this formula is actually talking about. So you kind of it, it give you a guidance on how to write them down and how to understand them once you write them down. So first understanding, and then you try to memorize, right? Uh, kind of before the exam, maybe for several days, you kind of memorize them every day, do a little bit of exercise, a couple minutes. Obviously, before the night of the exam, you definitely need to uh, get them imprint into your mind. And what do we do on the exam day, right? Once you're given the exam book, you write it down wherever you think they allow you to write things down, right? And put it away, that's it, it's yours. Uh, you don't need to worry about it, right? Is my formula correct? After uh, maybe, you know, 75 minutes into the exam and, and scramble around trying to say, okay, trying to recall what it looks like, what are you doing? It, you know, we, we don't need to struggle on that spot. We just write it down think it as given when our mind is super clear, we haven't worked up all the, uh, or spare up all the pistons in your brain, right? Make it easy. So that's the strategy, right? Memorize it, rehearse it before the exam, and then on the exam date, write it down on your exam book, wherever the uh, CFA Institute allow you to write something where your scratch paper is, okay? So that's um, the strategy. And I do believe after I have explained what, you know, why they have this look, right? They're not so, uh, alien-like, right? You don't know where they come from. They are actually very familiar uh, factors and in the right order. For put, right, we have the uh, strike price in the first place and then minus the spot price. 
And remember, strike price always related to D2, but it's the negative, the mirror image portion of the cumulative distribution function. So is for uh, the n minus D1, right? The, the second CDF attached to the uh, spot price of the underlying in the put black Scholes formula. So that's uh, what they look like. And they are what you need to memorize. All right. Another set of information we need to memorize are uh, the assumptions. Okay, we have a set of assumptions we need to both understand and remember. So first we have some assumptions about the stock return distribution. Uh, it's continuously compounded returns uh, because the actually this is the case when the continuous compounding make all the calculation easier in the mathematics uh, derivation. Okay, and these continuously compounded return are normally distributed and independent over time. It means uh, these returns are not correlated with each other over time, and there's no serial correlation within them. Also, there's no big jumps. They, they only move in very small zigzagging. Uh, pattern. Okay. This distribution assumption on the stock return means that the stock price itself, okay, now we're not talking about the return, the personage stuff, is rather a price, it's a dollar amount. That stock price itself will have a log normal distribution. And if you look at the log normal distribution, we realize this distribution have a nice property that your stock price won't go below zero because that's impossible by definition. Stock price is the uh, shareholders equity value and um, because companies are limited liability companies, so it's value stop at zero, it won't go below zero. So it, it gives the stock price a, a so-called correct support between zero and positive infinity. So that's log normal distribution of the underlying price, okay? And what we see here is um, you can have very stiff shape for the underlying price move uh, rank, right? In terms of distribution, so it's rather flexible, rather flexible distribution. We not really assume every stock price distributes in the same uh, general shape. It's quite uh, flexible. And this is the uh, standard normal distribution, right, of the return. This is the return, stock price return. Um, we notice that if we take a negative Core inside the CDF, the cumulative distribution function for standard normal because it's symmetric. Okay, take a negative value is equal to one minus what you already have for the positive value of that uh, uh, core, the D1 or D2. Okay, and we apply this result in our uh, Excel model. Just a little bit of reminder on top here is actually the uh, probability density function, the PDF, right? So if you have uh, the Z here, the, the core uh, inside here, the kernel, right, is 0.3, then uh, the, the cumulative uh, probability value will be 0 0.6179, okay? And 
n x right, is actually this line. As you have higher and higher kernel value, the uh, standard normal distribution, the cumulative distribution value goes from zero going up right here at 0.3, the kernel, the height is 0.6179. And then as it's going higher and higher, the um, value goes to one. So let's say, go back to our original formula. Let's just look at this, right? If you have a stock price that is going higher and higher, right? D1 is going to positive infinity and D2 um, also goes to positive infinity. So basically D1 and D2 will be extremely large value, make both cumulative distribution ND1 and ND2 very close to one. Then what do you get? You basically get this European um, car, the price, uh, or say the premium of this European car is basically the spot price minus the discounted uh, strike price, which makes sense. It's basically you're deep in the money, right? You're deep in the money, uh, The how much the car worth really depends on the uh, intrinsic value, right? Um, now think about for put option, right? If we have uh, the stock price become extremely low, stock price become extremely low, uh, the first term will be a very negative number. Right? It's far below zero. It means, well, n minus d2 and n minus d1 both will close to one again because uh you know d1 and d2 are big negative number once you take the negative sign for them they become big positive number again these two cdf become very close to one and then you have basically the discounted strike price minus the spot price which is close to zero and you're basically saying by holding a European put, you have a value that very close to what? Very close to the discounted strike price, right? Because the uh, spot price is close to zero. That's um, again, that makes sense, right? Your your put is deep in the money, and basically your your put worth the discounted strike price. So that, that actually makes sense in both ways. And that's why, um, you know, you cannot have this kind of result. Right? At least it should make sense in extreme cases. Obviously, this assumption, the underlying stock price follow a log normal distribution and the stock return follow a normal distribution and has no serial correlation, there's no jumps, right? This is an approximation. I, my own feeling is that um, for very short period of time, relatively short period of time, that's an okay assumption, but it's not necessarily 100% true all the time. Actually, uh, there have been research papers writing uh, option price incorporating stock price jumps. Okay, that can be put into the option price formula. But we, we are not going to that level in this course, obviously. Okay, now let's talk about the volatility. In the Black Scholes formula, we basically assume that we know the volatility or the variance or the standard deviation of this continuously compounded return of the underlying. Not only we know it, it's also constant over the life of the option. So it's a single constant number 
for this option. Not varying with time, which we also know it's not true. The volatility change over time. Why volatility can change? Uh, many different reasons. An obvious reason is that it's just sometimes uh, bad things happen, and then people can have different interpretation at different time about certain event. So the price can go up and down uh, intensively in several day or say a short, short period of time. That's um, and then once people kind of settle on the understanding of the event, uh, the stock price become more stable. Okay. The third assumption about the underlying stock is the future dividends for the underlying. We assume the continuously compounded dividend yield is known. Okay, either be a dollar amount or a fixed rate, the dividend fixed the dividend yield rate. Again, in our basic standard CFA curriculum version, uh, we assume zero dividend yield, but in the textbook, you can see that's just a simplification, make the presentation easier. In the curriculum, uh, you can totally incorporate the uh, dividend yield, at least in uh, the, the very simple, continuous compounding constant way. Right? All right. The Black Scholes formula also assumes some condition in the economic environment or say the trading environment. Number one, the risk of free rate is known and constant. Uh, this is not true for interest rate options. Obviously, if you have interest rate options, it means the interest rate can change. Also for bond options, uh, we simply know for, for a bond getting closer to its maturity, the, the applicable interest rate the treasury spot rates will change according to different maturity so it's not constant and we have daily or minute by minute interest rate changes so that's also not true but for the sake of this formula uh, we assume the risk of free rate is known and constant it's about the pricing of <coughs> the uh, underlying uh, stock the option for the underlying stock. Uh, you can if you, you worry about the interest rate risk, you can certainly have that. Right? We have talked about how to do that. Okay. Also, we need no transaction costs or taxes. Okay. In this setup, for big players, the, the, the large brokerage dealer houses in the financial market, the transaction cost can be quite low. But taxes, obviously we can never avoid the taxes. Uh, both these things can be relaxed. In other words, you can incorporate the transaction costs because we know, right, once you want to price a financial derivative, you need to construct a uh, replicating portfolio for the same payoff. Once you got that, um, you will have the long short position. Obviously, you need to have a lot of transactions. And for what matters, for Black Shows to work, you actually need to constantly trading, okay? Constantly trading on your replicating portfolio. Obviously, if you're constantly doing that, the transaction cost can accumulate a lot. So that's that's one uh, complication we should avoid at this stage. Also taxes, taxes can complicate the uh, model greatly. So both of them um, left out in, in our current version. Uh, if you're interested, you can find them out. Just they are, they make the model really complicated. The third assumption here is the possibility of short sale. You need to be able to sell short the underlying stock. Um, 
especially for heading put. Okay, especially for heading put. Uh, also, uh, we need to be able to borrow land at the risk of free rate. These these are kind of more or less standard assumption for other arbitrage pricing of financial derivatives. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about how the Black-Scholes formula is derived. Now, first, we have this uh, formula of so-called geometric Brownian motion of the underlying price. Right? What it says is that over time, right, the numerator on top here, the infinite change in the stock price over the stock price itself, right? The numerator here is the infinite change in the stock price. And as a proportion of the underlying price itself at this moment equals the alpha times dB, right? It depends on how much time you allow it to change and times a constant term. This constant term is known as the drift in the geometric Brownian motion or the expected return. Um, uh, on the underlying, okay? So there, there's this drift term. It's kind of a constant for the underlying. The un underlying is supposed to drift up. It's a risky asset, so the expected return is positive. But obviously we know that the stock price won't go up constantly all the time. So there's a... Uh, random term right there's a, a random walk term and this random work term it is itself is proportional to the return variance the or say the standard deviation of the return the volatility of the underlying return so that you know basically saying if you give it a longer time and following this ZT here, so-called Brownian motion or Wiener process. Sometimes people mention a martingale or say a diffusion process or basically a random walk. It's one particular kind of random walk. Okay. And so this D ZT term itself, it has a lot of properties. Okay, that's a complicated term. Uh, the mathematicians uh, will tell you all sorts of different properties. But all, all we need to know is that uh, the ZT itself can be the driving force behind the random part of the return re realized on the stock. And because this uh, Wiener process depends on time, right, the random movement in the return of the underlying stock will depend on time, depend on this winner process and proportional to the standard deviation of the return, okay? So that's the so-called movement. Now we can, if you write it out, what it says is uh, the change in the stock price for a very short period of time depend on, well, where you started for the underlying stock price and it has times the expected return, it will go proportional with time, so that the first term is easy. The second term is that there will be some up and downs, right? And these up and downs, the magnitude based on where we started, the uh, underlying price at the moment, times the its standard deviation of the return, right? these two are kind of the uh, base for the magnitude. And then the randomness come from the Brownian motion part the linear process part. Okay, why uh, we need this change in the stock price? Because remember, we have the hedged portfolio, right? We have the replicating portfolio. We just directly recall a replicating portfolio for the call from last uh, lecture, lecture 10 or say lecture uh, chapter 10. Instead of, you know, writing down the same um, formula used in the numerical example in lecture 10, we actually 
uh, write the update of that. What this one is saying, there's certain amount of money, right? And from lecture term, we know it's, if it's a car, it's, if it's a European car, right? The, we will have to borrow money. Uh, but then if you put the liability, uh, put a negative sign before the liability, it's an asset. Okay, it's an asset. So that is delta, the uh, change ratio of option premium to the change in the underlying stock price, right? Delta times the spot price of the underlying, that's kind of your asset, and then minus the uh, call, which is your liability. So this is really to start, we think about uh, from a dealer point of view, right? We have shorted, we have written a call, then we have purchased the underlying as our asset to uh, guard against or hedge that liability. If the hedge is done correctly, we obtain a uh, risk-free of portfolio, which will evolve at the risk-free rate. So this is the basic idea. Um, and then we once we have this portfolio, we can write down how it changed over time. Right? The change in the risk of free uh, asset, right, amount of money, is the risk of free return. Right? If we apply risk of re free return to the kind of total asset here. Right, and grow at time t. Right, that's how how much this the uh, asset portfolio right, will evolve over time. And then delta is a constant. It's kind of we assume that's a constant in in the current setup times the change in the stock price. Now this term is what we have above. From the geometric Brownian motion, we'll get this term, okay? Minus the change in the option premium. So what we are saying is that uh, as time passed by, the asset portion of your hedged portfolio, right? You have this long stock and written call. The long stock will change some, and you have a kind of weight on it, which is delta, and your liability on the written call also change some. When you put them together, these the, the combined hedge portfolio evolve at a risk of free rate, which means this asset amount grow at a risk of free rate. And that okay, can become a so-called partial differential equation. With some work, right? obviously we need to bring in what the uh, instantaneous change in the stock price is and that partial differential equation has a known solution with that solution uh, we will have the black scholes formula so what do we do again i've mentioned this the delta we know what's the definition is right it's the change in the call premium or option premium over the change in the uh, underlying price so we have delta in there we have um, the change in the stock price put it in there and we have the change in call premium uh, and with call premium we can actually uh, apply the so-called Ito's formula to, to give it itself a expression okay I will uh, leave out all the details but basically this is what the partial differential equation looks like. This is just to help you to uh, know the background. You don't need to worry about this. Okay. And now this one has that solution we have seen up front. Uh, looks like this. Let me see. Right, either way. The uh, solution actually looks like this. 
Okay. To reach into the solution, um, I've seen both complicated and simplified work. So, you know, if you're interested in the math, uh, there's a lot of to learn, but uh, for, for our need for the CFA curriculum, we just need to understand what is Black Shoals, uh, kind of have a little bit of background of where it come from, but mostly the assumptions and uh, a lot of other knowledge that we can derive from Black Shoals. All right, now let's look at a numerical example. Okay, so let's say the underlying price now is 86, 68. 50 cents, $68, 50 cents. The strike price is 65. So the, the if you're talking about a car, it's in the money. Risk of free rate, 4%. Time to expiration, 110 days. The standard deviation of the underlying return is 38%. Now look, look at our Excel model. This is the uh, strike uh, stock price strike price, time to maturity is 110 over 365. Maybe I can, yeah, you know, it's not exactly 30%. Risk of free rate, 4%. Sigma, the st standard deviation of the underlying stock return is 38%. Then we calculate D1. This is D1, you can see the formula here, right? The log of uh, stock price over the strike price plus um, where there's no dividend, right? No dividend yield, uh, or dividend yield is zero, right? D5 is the uh, risk of free rate plus uh, a half of the variance, a half of the variance of this. Uh, underlying return times t. Here, the t is 110 because we have this. It's already capital T minus uh, lowercase t. Right? And then we use sigma itself times the square root of uh, the time left in the uh, option. So that's d1. And d2 is simply uh, d1 minus uh, the standard deviation again times the square root of the time left. Okay, so d1, d2. Then we use the normal standard. Right? This is the standard second s here distribution. Okay, it's the distribution function of standard normal. For d1, apply that to d1 and d2. And for car option. We have again the spot price times uh, ND1. This is the green green number, and minus the strike price. Strike price sixty five here purple. Uh, discounted at a risk of free rate B five and B four is the time. Right. Uh, this is the discounted strike price, the purple one, times. B12, which is D2, the orange one. So that's the formula for European car price using black shows. And uh, this is the European put, European put. Okay. And notice that in the uh, for N minus D2. We have one minus N D two. Okay, that's the uh, that's the cumulative distribution function part. So now we have the call prices. Okay, so we have this uh, call premium uh, seven ninety one, so seven dollars and ninety one cents. The put premium three sixty three. This is a numerical example on a non-dividend paying stock. All right. 
if we look at different strike prices, okay, on the horizontal here in this picture, I have uh, strike price, uh, the, the underlying price at the expiration, uh, no, the underlying price now, okay, as lowercase t from zero to positive, remember we are at money at 68.5, right? We have the blue line as the call premium calculated by Black Scholes. And it, it has this region kind of above the intrinsic value, the green line, this region above the intrinsic value. Basically, what it is is because this call uh, around the add money range, it is add money. So the call is should have a zero value, but it also means there's chance for it to move up, right? It's not expired yet. It's still 110 days for it to move up. So there is this time value or speculative value, um, make it higher than the intrinsic value. So even a add money option, right? The instantaneous payoff is zero in zero intrinsic value. It has this time value in it. So you have this convex line instead of um, this kink uh, intrinsic value line. For European put, it looks like this. Still, it trace the intrinsic value line, but around the money, it lifts up. It lifts up in a convex way, convex towards the uh, money turning point, the strike price turning point. So uh, this is what it looks like, and we actually have drawn this kind of picture before when we talk about the so-called time value or speculative value in option premium. Uh, but this is actually a direct result. Okay, I have the Excel model here. If you go here, right, I what I did basically change for different stock price. Okay. And the point here is that you cannot really put zero here. Then you cannot take log. So it's a, just a very small number, close to zero. Um, you see, then D1 and D2 become really big negative number. And uh, for put, right, you've got ones in the cumulative distribution function for N minus D1 and N minus D2. So here, right, if you look at Again, for put, let's look at some intuition. Basically, the stock price changed for $10. Um, you, you, you look at the put premium also changed for $10. The, the delta is exactly one. Uh, it really means when the put option is highly deep in the money, then the uh, stock price change is basically the put premium change. This is how I, I, I draw the two pictures. This is how I draw the two pictures. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit uh, for the options on futures. Options on future is actually called the black formula. This is in the CFA curriculum. So uh, we do need to know this. It's also called the called black model in the CFA curriculum. So we, this is something we need to know. Okay. Uh, to simplify things, we set lowercase t as zero, which just makes things, you know, you don't have the capital T minus the lowercase t, just capital T itself. Right? Capital T is how far the uh, uh, expiration date is. Then, we think about what is the forward price or future price here. It's the standard calculation, right? It's the spot price. You tell it, right? You tell it by the uh, dividend yield. And obviously, there's funding cost or cost of carry for the stock. That's the risk of free rate. So this is the standard calculation for the forward price. And then, uh, what do we know? If we discounted the forward price using the risk of free rate, we got the tailed amount for the stock, 
right? Remember the total amount is saying what? To get one unit of the underlying stock someday in the future, you don't actually need to have one full unit now because there's dividend paid to it and you can reinvest that dividend into the stock. Okay, then what we have is actually the, uh, you know, you can pull out the risk-free discounting. You can pull out the risk-free discounting because why? Because all the uh, things that times the uh, cumulative distribution of standard normal are future payments. They are all future payments. Okay. The forward price, the future price is a future payment. The strike price is future payment. So now it's rather very simple very simple both of these future terms discounted to present value you get the present premium right the current value of the car premium on futures and d1 d2 here d1 d2 here is what simply right take a log of the future price over strike price now right these two are both Again, they are both future values, so future payments. So there's, they don't need to adjust each other. And uh, we have this straightforward plus a half of the standard deviation squared, sigma squared, the variance of the underlying return uh, times t. And the normalizing term, right, make things into a kernel for uh, the normal distribution is the square root of this this one, the, the variance times t, right? It's the standard deviation times the square root of t. And d2 has the similar flavor. Let me talk a little bit about things here. It, it's actually what we have is really based on Black Scholes formula. Now, let's go back. So, in Black Shows, okay, in Black Shows or, or textbook formula, there is this uh, tailed amount originally. Right? There is this tailed amount. Now, this tailed amount we have shown is what? It's the future price. Let's go back to here. It's future price discounted at a risk of free rate. So that's why if you put this tailed amount into the original formula, you can replace it with the future price discounted at a risk of free rate. And the second term is exactly the strike price discounted at a risk of free rate. That's why you can pull out the risk of free rate discounting outside of the bracket. And then all you left is the future price and the strike price, right? Each of them times a CDF of standard normal. So there's actually no real change in the Black Scholes formula. It's just rewrite. It's always just rewrite. And let's look at D1 and D2. They are also just rewrite as well. Again, we actually carry around the uh, dividend yield here, delta. And what we are going to do is to put uh, this delta and r inside the log. Right? We know when two terms times together, you can, in the log, right, you can separate them as plus, or say log st plus log e to the minus delta times t minus t. Well, when you take log against the natural number E itself, you will get naturally delta minus delta t minus delta here times t capital T minus lowercase t. That's that's how I put this one here. So in the numerator in the second line, you actually have the tailed amount for the underlying. And then because the strike price k here, which k 
can be x in other slides, okay? The strike price is in the denominator. It's actually a negative term. And then to make this positive risk of free rate negative, uh, we also put it in the denominator. So this slash means the, the it will be a negative of log of e to the negative r times uh, time to expiration, which basically means you have positive r times capital T minus lowercase t. Okay, so that's that's why. Uh, when it's positive r on the first line in the first line we can put it into the denominator in the log uh, as a positive r so this says what this is the discounted strike price that the, we, we've been talking about that all the time right so now you actually see inside of the log right one is a tailed amount of the underlying the other in the number uh, in the denominator, it's the uh, present value of the strike price. So it's totally um, in the right place. Okay. Plus, now the only thing left is a half of the variance times the time to expiration. Okay, so this is from the first line to the second line, this is simply rewrite thing. Simply rewrite things. And then finally, remember we have a relationship between the uh, future price or forward price and the tailed amount, right? You you pay the cost of carry the risk of free compounding on this tailed amount. Obviously, to keep things the same, we will have to discount it because we have compounded it and then discounted it back right? so that we have done nothing. We didn't change anything, right? We, we did something, but we didn't change anything. And then what you have is the log of the future price over the strike price, because this discounting at the risk of free rate for the tail, uh, the forward price and the discounting on the um, strike price cancel out each other, become one, right? So now it's the just log of, the forward price over the strike plus a half of the standard deviation, uh, a half of the variance times time to expiration. Okay, this is how where the D1 come from. Again, what it really says is that as long as you have this black scholes formula, right? You have this black scholes formula, and now you say, all right, my options on the future. And now we need to get the future price. All we have done is to rewrite what, um, whatever there in the black shows, right? Get the future price out from black shows. And that actually uh, make a lot of sense because, you know, the spot price of the underlying and the strike price, they are at a two different time. But once you get into the black model, the futures price is exactly at the same time for the um, strike price. Right? That's, they kind of happen at, at the same time. Okay, that's the black formula. That's the black formula itself. Now let's look at one more time, we have this idea. The textbook sort of mentioned this idea here. We have talked about this idea in lecture 10. That is, if you have an American option on futures, it is not only more valuable than the European option because the flexibility in, in exercise, especially because once you exercised your American option on futures contract, your futures contracts may immediately receive margin account credit, right? Start to earn interest income. But if you have American options on forwards, this is not the case. Again, this is about options on futures and options on forward 
options on futures, you can earn interest income by early exercise. It makes the early exercise uh, of American option on futures extra attractive, right? As compared to the American option on stocks themselves, right? If it's on futures, it has an additional layer of attractiveness of earning interest income on the uh, margin account. Okay. Look at our numerical example. Uh, say one year later, the price of natural gas is uh, 6.5 uh, MMBTU. The risk of free rate is 2%. MMBTU is supposed to be an energy unit. Okay. The option input, the again, the futures price is $6 and a half. Strike price is and money six dollars and a half. Risk of free rate two percent. Standard deviation of the natural gas future price is uh, a quarter percentage. Time is one year. Time is one year. So um, look at the call price and the put price. Okay, again, we have the futures price. Here, you know, I just copied the uh, names here. This is actually the futures price. Strike price on the European option on this future times one. Uh, risk of free rate 2%. Standard deviation of the futures price D1 and D2. Now, notice that. D1 and D2, because of this asymmetry, uh, no, symmetry, because of this symmetry in standard normal distribution, and it's, you know, D1 and D2, just opposite value, just opposite value. Um, but actually, for the cumulative distribution, the, you know, the other is, Kind of one minus the other. If you put them together, um, you can see the value here is one. Okay. And then actually, the European car price or European car premium equal to the European put premium. Why is that? Because it's an add money option on the future. If you have the put car parity, and remember the Call premium minus put premium equals the present value of difference between the futures or forward price minus the strike. Now we have a add money option on the future, which means the strike equals the, to the uh, futures price or forward price, make the put call parity right hand side zero. So put premium equal to call premium. That's a very interesting case. Okay. In other words, if you think about using this option to formulate a synthetic forward, it's give you exactly zero cost, right? And which is the uh, cost for synthetic forward? Uh, is the cost of a forward contract to sign up zero zero cost? All right. Now let's look at uh, applying the Black Scholes formula to other kinds of assets. So the first is the pre -for prepaid forward prices. Um, still, the underlying is the stock, and we know that the prepaid forward prices on the underlying stock equals to this held amount uh, discounted at the dividend yield, and uh, for the uh, prepaid strike price, you discount that at the risk of free rate, right? The strike price discounted at the risk of free rate. With the call premium, again, we uh, dropped, the only thing we dropped is uh, the lowercase t, which is zero, right? This call formula, if we take out 
the lowercase t, that's our call formula. And on that page, Okay, so if we need to replace right, the stock price with the prepaid stock price and the strike price with the prepaid strike price, the rest remain the same. We only need to replace those. And we actually see right in this contract, we are talking about the prepaid price. That's, you know, we just replace the uh, tail the quantity on the stock unit with the prepaid stock price and uh, the uh, discounted strike price is, is exactly the prepaid strike price so that's that's about it okay it's uh, just a rewrite of the original black shows formula just like what we have seen for the option price on the futures the D1 and D2 has this way simpler uh, expression. It's the prepaid stock price over the prepaid uh, strike price now in the log. And D2 is still D1 minus the standard deviations scaled by the time. All right. Now, to look at a numerical example, we actually think about the dividend paid as uh, discrete. Okay, discrete dividend payment. Let's say the underlying price is now forty-one and the strike price forty dollars. The uh, standard deviation is thirty percent. The risk of free rate is eight percent. This is an annual risk of free rate. Um, the expiration will be a quarter. Dividend is three dollars in one month. So the present value of that three dollar dividend in the month is this uh, three dollar discounted at the eight percent for a month. Eight percent divided by twelve is the uh, discount rate for one month. So it's two dollar ninety eight cents. Then when we take out the present value of this dividend from the underlying stock price forty one dollars, we got left of $38 to do. That's the kind of current stock price, right, in the stock on the future date when the underlying is delivered. Yeah, the, uh, the dividend is gone because the, the option is for three months later. Now, what we have to do is actually to use 3802 in the Black Shows formula. So let's look at that. So thirty-eight oh two. Okay. Strike price forty dollars and um In this uh, formula here, I actually left the strike price not discounted. Remember, in our formula, right, we are supposed to discount it. And then the R plus minus stuff of the variance times T is gone. But uh, here it's still in the it's still outside in the numerator is still outside of this log so it, it's there okay the discounting of the strike price is there in the formula so that's our calculation of d1 and d2 and then again apply the standard normal distribution cumulative distribution function we got a value of nd1 and d2 then we can price the car put so the car when there's a student paid to the underlying before the car uh, expiration date, the call value uh, declined compared to if otherwise. If we look at this price, right, the current stock price is $41. The call actually was $3.39, almost $3.40. But once that $2 or $3 dividend is paid, and the call only worth $3.40. 
$1.76 or $76.3. So that's the uh, numerical example for the option, call option on a stock that pays discrete dividend. All right. How about currencies? Uh, we can price the option on a prepaid forward on a currency. And then we know, again, the prepaid forward on a currency is the spot exchange rate. Right? You need to tail it, replace the dividend yield with the foreign interest rate, foreign risk-free rate, or say the risk-free rate on foreign currency. And that's the uh, prepaid exchange rate. And um, again, let's look at a new numerical example. The spot rate is $1.25 per pound, and the strike is $1.20 per pound. The uh, standard deviation is 10%, the risk of free rate 1%, one year expiration date, foreign, or say the pound, uh, risk of free rate is 3%. So the US dollar risk of free rate is 1%. Now look at our Excel model. This is example 12.4. Right. The spot exchange rate 1.25 and then the uh, strike price is 120. Now Again, right, we are actually supposed to have the prepaid number kind of all discounted, and uh, the discounting is actually inside the numerical, uh, the numerator, right, but outside of the log in the numerator. So that's how the uh, how I put those things into the formula in this Excel model. Uh, pretty straightforward. No, no big change from other. Um, you know, previous examples. It's all the same kind of stuff. And then we got option values, right? We got option values. Okay, that's our numerical examples.